Okay. So it's great. I mean, one of the things interesting to me is always is that you know people in evolutionary biology, so these same sort of questions that paleontologists study, right? Just different organisms. We really don't talk enough to each other. We don't have this interaction here. Um, <coughs> so I'm gonna talk about this, and it's not as scary as it sounds. Okay. So I'm making it as easy as A B C. A B C. <laughs> What I'm going to talk about today, um, sort of very briefly, why phylogenetic methods, why is making methods hard, okay? the overall context of this work, how to avoid doing hard math, that's a good thing. Um, this is how we deal with this, some example results, put it in the context of like, why this stuff is useful, and also what's happening in the future. And so, for those of you who are paleontologists, I imagine you care about some of these. The issue presumably already believed in your heart. Right? Those of you who are just generally geologists, you need to know this, and some of this would also be brought into you too. <coughs> and also, that means this is informal, so if you have questions, if you want to understand something, stop, move the whiteboard, we'll be good. Okay, so if you're not getting it, this talk is for you. Right? If it's not helping you, or not interesting to you, let me fix it. <coughs> okay, so phylogeny is this um, diagram showing, you know, here's an ancestral group. And then the little species and it's broke up into multiple affluent species, right? And we can use organized life, and that's fine and good and important. Also, we use these to understand understand big questions. <coughs> so, in this, like, so this case, one question is: we often see small genome size and things fly. Right? It's because DNA is really heavy. And I think it relates to a metabolic rate. Fast metabolic rate optimized for fast production of protein. Small genome. Okay. <coughs> and so the question is, you know, birds are kind of dinosaur. If birds evolve their small genome size after flight, or essentially they have a small genome size. So we use this tree and some correlations we find across life and predict genome size in various non avian dinosaurs and, and look in the tree and see how it changed. And so we see, you know, here's birds. And the ancestors of birds also had small genome sizes. So evidently, small genome size evolved before flight, which would su suggest that a high metabolic rate evolved before flight, which makes sense given their relatives. Um, <coughs> there's another case of <coughs> use of phylogenetic methods. So the phylogeny of modern whales, okay, and then this is showing <coughs> biogeographic history, and this idea that what affected whale evolution, and speciation, is these barriers arising and disappearing in the ocean basin basins. And so they tested for faster rates of diversification rate changes, so the rate of speciation and extinction changing when you have big changes in the ocean basins. And they found that in these red arrows, they work. Okay, so and tens of millions of years ago, the speciation rate of whales changed because of how oceans were changing. Okay, so you can get this stuff with phylogenetics. Before this you need methods. And that's been the bottleneck. So what we're trying to do here is fix that bottleneck. Okay, so here's a very basic method. Okay, those are ways of, of looking at if you pair the species, it takes into account the derivatives. Okay, just use a simple Brownian notion. So it's like a normal distribution, very basic. Seven years later, someone used this method to look at different rates of evolution. 14 late years later, so I'm going to look at this great idea to use two rates. <coughs> right? So, you know, so 14 years ago from one rate to two rates. A long time for methods. <coughs> so, we might make sense to figure out a way to speed this up so people can actually ask questions with methods that, have, that they can have available. So, a lot of times you can't ask until you have a method. So, this is only faster than this group. Well, do they just add two rates? So, the method two rates. One thing that's interesting about phylogenetics is, you know, first you see all these different models, right? So you see a model for DNA evolution, you see a model for binary trait evolution, you see a model for rates changing over time, you see a model for transitions. These all seem like very different models. If you look under the hood, we're all the same. It's all this basic rate matrix. We just relabel the stuff. Okay, so it's basically instantaneous rates are going from zero to one or one to two. Okay. And sometimes we call state 1, 1, and we call it G. We have all the same model underneath. 
And <coughs> for continuous traits, it's similar. Okay? So, you know, I hope you all recognize this. Um, so this is a, gives you the probability of continuous data on a tree. Okay? Um, if you think of a single variable, and so like our standard normal distribution, okay? um, it's this equation. And so it's similar. So think about you know, doing simple, you know, what's the standard deviation? <coughs> what's the mean for normal? Which is like that, where here's the standard deviation. Okay? Like once to this, here's the mean. Okay? So just like that, but rather than just a single um, standard deviation because of, of relatedness. Okay? And so <coughs> basically all the models we use for continuous traits are just this one model. So in a classic Brownian motion, just a single rate of change, we have you know, these states. We can have different rates, it's all just quantifying this. We can have different optima, it's quantifying these. Okay? It's all just tweaking this basic model. So for discrete traits, we have one model we label. With the traits, we have one model we label. That's like two models, okay? which will result in thousands of papers. So I mean, they're very useful. We can have a way to get new models. Also, all these models have some weird behavior. So, we'll describe Brownian motion as a random walk, right? a drunkard's walk. So, you have a guy who's had a little bit of a drink, he's sort of tottering around, right? And he goes up the street and totters back and forth, and totters back and forth. And then, at this point, he speciates. So, the analogy breaks down, right? And now, there's two guys tottering around, okay? <coughs> and you might think, okay, now they can bump into each other, now they can see each other. And get into a you know, bottle fight, something. Right? But actually, that's not the model we use. We assume that after that point, they each get their own identical street. Right? So after speciation, all our models assume there's no more interaction between species. We know it's not true. Right? We know there's mimicry. We know there's character displacement. If you're in the big seeds, they're all gone. I have to eat the small seeds and the small seeds. There's all these different behaviors with species interact with each other that our models just don't deal with. And there's many such questions that are like that, where our model just can't deal with it. So, this character displacement here is mimicry, and this will bound at evolution. Right? So the drunk can't walk past the building or wall, right? Or you can't get bigger than a certain body size if you have a of oxygen, those can support you. Right? Our models can't deal with that. It's not part of the model. Um, in fact, it's a varying external parameter. Right? So maybe your body size is limited by available O2, and that change that maximum through time. You can't deal with that. Having a mixture of processes happening over the tree, we can't deal with that either. Okay. So our overall goal with all this stuff is to make it so it's easy for empiricists to build and use their own models. That's why I'm waiting 21 years for someone like me to come on and just like, ooh, I have two parameters now. Yay! But they can just develop their own models directly. And our approach for this is something called approximate Bayesian computation. So we, we didn't invent this. This is the existing thing. We adopted it for comparative methods. And again, this has been used in many different models in biology already, um, largely in particular use cases. Okay, so to care about simultaneous divergence or um, a particular model of human evolution, do humans evolve in this place or this place? So it's that sort of comparison of models. Okay. We're doing we're doing a more general case of that. So let's get rid of the equation. That math is hard. And this is this is very limitations on how we can analyze it. Okay. And just get down to <coughs> simulation. Right? So if I asked something about this, if I said, let's probably have heads for this coin, right? what distribution would you use? If they, if they gave you this data and said, how do I figure out the probability of getting heads? How do you estimate the probability of getting heads? Right, and so you have to sort have of a null or prior of 50-50. You can use, say, like a binomial quick distribution or something like that, right? So, let's say, um, you know, if, if I can put, so in this case, we're probably getting that many heads is optimized at this probably of heads, right? So it's just doing that, okay? However, for a lot of our problems, we don't have the equation, right? So for bounded evolution, we don't have the equation. 
for interacting organisms that don't have an equation. Right? So let's get rid of doing equations, bad equations. Okay, now what? Well, we can just make up the data and try it out. So we could say, all right, I don't know what the probability of heads is. Let's assume it's 0.2. Okay? When we simulate a whole lot of times, let's see what I get. And check and say, oh, I've got my exact distribution one of these times. Right? So given this probability of getting heads, the probability of this outcome is 1 over 10. And that's what likelihood is. That's just the probability of your data. Okay, so here I'm just estimating the probability of my data by making up data under this, mo under this model. And then you try doing it again with 0.3 or 0.4. It's going to make changes. Okay. So no equations here, just simulation. Okay. Let's see how this works. So let's imagine I'm doing this. <coughs> and here they do, they do 200 simulations. So I do, try a various amount of p's. Here's the right, true distribution of likelihood. And then I try just doing 200 flips, which one? And I get this sort of estimate. Okay, not great. Then I do 2,000. Okay, it's getting better. Right. 200,000. 200,000. Right. But I'm doing 200 flips for each value. I'm getting very close to this observed likelihood surface without actually doing any equations. I'm just simulating and counting. Simulating is easy. Like my computer said, every time step, you know, move a little bit and then stop. That's simulation. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. So that's a basic game of playing. So rather than doing the math and six sets of six equations, we're going to simulate and estimate probabilities that way. So how do we simulate? Um, so what I'm going to do is continuous time, right? So uh, discrete time. So we did continuous time. It's scary. It's back to these equations, right? I said, you know, I want to go from here to here and simulate that evolution. Well, we just pull from this distribution. That's hard to do. Instead, let's do discrete time. Okay? So break this up into chunks and say, okay, at my next time step, where you are is your current time step plus a random number from the normal. And it's not, what I can do is I can say, okay, I may have a situation where I have a mean of zero. So that means I wander around with no net bias, right? Okay, I can see how that looks like look, 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 data. Or I could say, okay, let's make our mean five. And okay, and I keep wandering around, but I tend to go this way. Right? And I can see if my data resemble the data similar to the mean of zero, or mean of five better. And now I'm showing trees where the tips are coeval. There's no, there's no requirement for that. Right? So we have a tree that one tip is here, one tip is here, one tip is here. That's fine too. Okay. And so that's our time. And so for a given taxon, so those would know R, recognize this. So for the given taxon, I, the next state is just where it is now. plus some function of what that taxon's doing, plus some function of the other taxon. Okay. So why are we doing this? Well, for the intrinsic one, which is just what we do with current, right? A species evolves on its own, and a species, each species evolves on its own. Don't be in here, it's evolved. Okay. Um, and that makes sense for certain kinds of models, right? Some sort of, if each species evolves its own adaptive peak, that makes sense. Um, <coughs> it's just changing from, you know, different states on its own, and then it can also from zero to one, one to zero. That makes sense. Okay. Um, but I also have a function where species can move based on what other species are doing. So it could be that if I have enough species right here, that my image can move over this way, right? So I can have more food resources. And so now the species can know that, and it can evolve in response to that. Um, and I can pass it various instruments. I can pass it these parameters of music for evolution. How fast do you wiggle? That sort of thing. I can give it its current state. Right? And I can also give it time from present. So I want to say, 
post KT, you now evolve faster because now it's only got empty niches. I can do that more because it knows what time it is. But the process is just, you know, this is how species evolve. It's not because it's consciously knowing that, but by the simulated individual can do that. Okay? The extrinsic function is the same, but also I pass up the states of the attacks as you can move away from the neighbors or move toward your neighbors. Okay. Another thing is how you summarize these matches. Right? So before I simulated and showed how times I got an exact match. Right? So <coughs> you know, how many times do I actually get this exact string? Okay. So that works for some things. I mean, people are doesn't work for that. Okay. Another thing I could do is just, I could summarize it as the proportion of heads. How do I simulate five eighths heads? Yeah. Or I could do the result of the last flip. So the only way of summarizing the data is just saying the last flip of the tails. Okay. So some bit of jargon here is something called sufficient summary statistic. So it's sufficient, that's all you need. If you want to estimate heads for this under normal, you know, normal statistics, you can use this or you can use this, and they both give you the same answer. Right? This gives you an answer, but not very good. Right? It tells you probably if heads is not one, we're going to go T, but it doesn't have very little information. So I might not want that statistic, but I can get I can use either of these. <coughs> and the procedure here is I can say using either one, I can say if you observe my simulate equals zero, so if they're exactly the same, so if I simulate this and also observe this, then I say it's a match. I simulate my data. Right? Like before I simulated data ten times, I got a match one time. So my probably gain the data was one out of <coughs> Now, what if you have something like head size? Okay. Am I going to simulate and get exactly, I don't know, 20 centimeters, 20.11 centimeters? No. Okay. So I had to be a little fuzzier about that. So now I say, if observed, my simulate is less than some <coughs> small value, epsilon. Then I found this a match. So it would be exactly the right, it would be close enough to get the kind of match. Okay? Does that make sense? And so, one thing you should be worried about is how you set this value. Excellent question. I don't know. So, right, I need to pick up. Um, yeah. and this actually makes model comparison between different models a problem, too. Okay. So you have sufficient summary statistics, they have all the info you need, great, you're golden. Okay. Um, Professor Arnon said about sufficient, but we don't know what it is. So to actually prove sufficiency, you have to do math. And again, if you don't know math, right? You do it without knowing math. So what can we do? Okay. Um, the other case, and here's our drunkards walking again, is we're trying to summarize this across the tree. So we're trying to do this as generally as possible. Remember, we're trying to think for all empiricists to use, not just one particular problem. If one particular problem, you can say, okay, just look at genome size. It's the only summary that's happening to me. But we're trying to do this general to target. Okay. And so here's our abstracted data. And so what we've done is program a huge variety of summary stats. Okay, so basically these are things where you pick your data, Stick in a function and get a number out. So I could say, okay, data, what's the mean? Five. Okay, that's one summary step. Right? Another one is I can put, stick into a model and say, data, what's the, what's the likelihood of you under that model? Okay. So that's a little summary step. Let's say this, this model is the true model for evolution. Let's say something to put it into and get the answer out. Okay, again, get a number out. And so what we do here <coughs> is try a wide variety of summary stats, stuff like the raw chip values, so species one, what values that have, um, to comparison between species, to ancestral states on the tree, the whole, you know, everything is in that set. Um, and then what you add to that is figure out which summary stats are useful. Um, because for some models, if I want to look at <coughs> um, the rate of evolution, how fast things are wiggling, well, the rate under the simple model might be relevant, okay? 
but the trait minimum might not be relevant. We don't have any information about that. So I only filter on those that are most relevant. Um, so, here is a case where each data point here, let's see, represents one simulation. Okay, so, we have 200,000 simulations for this as well. Okay, and for each simulation, I have a basic tree. And I say, okay, so I start at root value, say, 30, simulate up that tree. Then I take the tips and say, <coughs> um, what's my mean in the tips? Okay, and how does that differ from the mean for my observed data? Okay, so I have one true history that I simulate under. So it's my true history here, I start at 10. Okay, now I simulate data many times and see what the mean is. Okay, and I find, and I plot, just plot that distance. All right, so if I simulate, I start at 15, right? Simulate my tree up, and I find my mean is 16. Okay? And then I made a group data as mean value 10. So 16 minus 10 is 6. So I plot at 15, value of 6. Okay? And I do the same thing again, and this time I get 14, and plot a value of 4. Okay? And do that many, many times. And what I see here is that, wow, it's cool. So these distances reach a minimum at what happens to be the true value. Okay, so in this case, the raw mean is giving me information about what this root state is. Okay, so I can estimate it just by sitting many times and looking at that mean and finding the mean that minimizes closest my summary data to my observed data. That then tells me then that the value I use the root of my summary data equals the value of my, of my true data. So now I've estimated my such a state, but actually putting my true data on the tree, or putting the model, just simulating on the tree, by using this particular measure. So that's one of the summary step. Here we have a bunch of summary steps. Okay. And so here I care about what the root state is. Okay. <coughs> the mean gives me some information. The maximum value gives me some information, so it's the minimum value. Okay. The meaning gives me information. Um, even the state of tip two gives me information about this. But something like um, this, the probability of the data under a simple model, gives me very little information. Okay, so if I care about the root state, I should use one of these, or perhaps a set of these, to estimate that state. Okay. So now what I've done is throw the kitchen sink in, and then let the data tell me what parts are most informative about my true, true model. And for different parameters I care about, we get different summary stats. So for <coughs> grounding motion, the rate of wiggle, right? Um, all these values give me some information, right? Where now the raw mean works so well, doesn't give you information about it. Because right? the mean just tells you where you are, but not how much you're moving around from that. Okay? Whereas the minimum mass gives me some information, not a great deal. So, again, for root state, I care about this one. For rate, I care about this one. Okay, so that's get to all that stuff is to get me the likelihood. I could also get the posterior probability. Bayesian. So, do people know what Bayesian is? Bayesian steps? Yes. Good. So, this gives me the probability of my data given the parameter, right? And I can get the probability of the parameter itself from our prior. Right? So how much do I sample 0.2 as a p versus 0.4 versus 0.6? So we can get a prior. And combine them, we get the posterior. Right? So we can get a Bayesian posterior probability. Okay. All right. So the basic algorithm you use here, mm -hmm. this is useful for, I mean, this is basic for ABC in general. So not just phylogenetics. We're going to use ABC for figuring out things, you know, Water on Mars, the data. You can do this too. Okay. Um, 
So you sample your parameters for prior distributions. So I say, okay, I don't know much about coins, so I say that coins have either terms of being zero to one for heads. Because they know a lot about coins. I think coins are mostly 0.5 for heads, so they're kind of mostly on 0.5. That's so put those priors in that way. And then simulate data. Just evolve data using my very simple discrete time model. Okay? Which things can repel, repel each other and such. Then I summarize that data. I'm going to go very summary stats. Okay? If that summary stat is, if that distance is less than epsilon, right? Same simulation. And then those that survive, that I save, give me posterior probabilities. Okay, so here's distance, and here's my current value, my you know, area of plus or probably maybe here, right? So I know that the value is mean here, plus or minus this. Okay, so I get both the value and the credibility. Okay. And with a different true value, I get a different distribution. Right, so the red shows the true value, so it goes from here to here, and the distribution moves over here. Um, let me skip this part because it's a little too detailed. Okay. So what I can do then is take my prior, which is my gray bar here, say I don't know what say it could be, the information, and get my posterior out. Okay. Um, in this case, my true value is blue line. Okay, my estimated value is the red line plus this confidence. Right? So let's refer to a tree of 30 taxa. I'm actually doing okay. Right? So I'm not right at the blue line, but I'm pretty close. Okay? Here's the same thing for the rate. Right? So here's the truth, and over here. Okay? Um, that's the thing where you do the map. How about something like character displacement? Here's something where species move away from other species through time. We have no models to deal with this. And here we show that, you know, here's my prior. Okay. I believe at first there's very little, I think a lot of weight on having no displacement happening in nature. And I find out that my estimated value actually tends to be really close to my true value. It's mine. Right. So before we couldn't look at the character displacement. Now with this approach, we can simulate many times and say the data are most similar to data where there's this much character displacement. Let's estimate this parameter value. Okay. This primary value is 0.5, which I didn't give you units, but that's what it means. Or what it looks like. So to figure that out, we can just do another simulation and just show you a realization of that. Okay, so this actually is data from, from lizards that live in Cuba. Okay. Um, <coughs> and we see this much character displacement, stuff is definitely moving apart from each other, so it's spreading out. Right? There's still some crossing. And even though there's displacement, they can still cross. And they tend to be spread out. If they had a stronger value, they push apart much more. A weaker value, they have much more crossing. Right, so this tells me that under this model, there's a significant amount of, well, you know, biologically meaningful amount of character displacement. Okay. <coughs> um, here's another empirical example. Okay. So the actual data is about <coughs> these flowers. Right? These flowers have these really crazy things called nectar spurs. And what happens is they produce the nectar that birds or other colonists want at the tips. And so you have to have the right length of tongue or beak or something to get in there and get them. You can also see color difference. And so the purplish flowers kind of, kind of attract bumblebees and they have very short nectar spurs. They feed very short tongues. Okay. These ones are probably hummingbird pollinated and these are probably hawk moth pollinated. Okay. And <coughs> These authors postulate a model where you have this distinct fitness, right? where you have one pollinator, and then you shift to another pollinator, you can evolve a, a, a much longer nectar spur to split that pollinator. Right? So you can go here, and go split, and get a good peak. Um, and they also only predict a, a switch from shorter to longer spurs. Because most models we have that have peaks, so I had to go up and down between peaks. So, are there distinct peaks? Yes. Now, is that evolution punctuated? Okay, and they found yes. Okay. Good. 
But again, their model doesn't incorporate their, their the way they analyze their data doesn't actually incorporate their full model of this increase. Okay. So their entire model is coded here. Okay. Which looks like a lot, but it's actually, you know, what, 10 lines of code. Right. So basically, <coughs> if you're just loving normally, your new value is just your old value plus a little normal number. So your nectar spur length is the same value, it's a little bit bigger or smaller. Right. Or rarely, <coughs> you go from that small value and you increase suddenly. So you're you know, these two processes happen in the trick. Okay. What determines which one happens? So what is this? So we do a background process unless this random number is bigger than this number in the parameter. So by changing this value, you can say, you know, if this is a small number, then we always always do this big jump. If it's a big number, we almost never do this big jump. So then we can figure out how often the jumps happen. So, and that's it. That's the whole model. Right? So, you know, few if states, if, if, else, done. Okay. And let me show you. <coughs> so, this is the background rates, how much does this rate bigger normally? And then, does it change a pollination shift? So when you do have the shift, we, our model lets you do it either bigger or smaller, you set that parameter. Right? And we estimate here, you often increase. That's what suggests that the model's right. Um, <coughs> and so we can use our new approach to say, yes, this is biased, like the model sets to the right. Okay. It worked perfectly? No. So here we see, we put in a unit, uh, this picture prior, right? So what you should have is either, either we happen to be exactly right, and so what we predicted is what happened, or our data has no information about this. Right? Then we try a different prior and find out that yeah, we still don't have a lot of information. Okay? So this tells us that for this particular parameter, how often we do this big jump, the data has very little information. Which is good. So it's good to know when you know something and when you don't know something. And so what we've done <coughs> is this is all coded now as an R package. This shows us coding it a few times. So each little step here is a modification of source code. Okay? And so we've made it all open source. So I can go and like see what the code is and what it looks like. Okay. <coughs> and you can see we have multiple things working on it. Okay. Um, okay. And we did it in R. And why in R? Well, it's keep a R. Right. So, so the goal is to make it easier for people to use. Right. So most people are in at least in the ontology, we're using R for analyses. Okay, so we're making an R package. There's books about R, there's help forms about R, there's guides to all the packages in R, so people can use this pretty easily. And I think I'll stop there. Um, yeah. So, there's future work we can do. Now, I'll mention the advantages. So the advantages are it's Bayesian, it's flexible, we made it so it's somewhat robust to user laziness, so it's set to automatically tune itself so it works well. Right? So if you want to do a fast one, it won't let you. Good. And also it gets faster as computers get faster. Right? The advantage is it's Bayesian, so if you don't like priors, top some of the prior. So some people don't like bringing the prior beliefs to complete analysis, want the data drive at all. You make that's always possible for Bayesian. So I'm usually watching Bayesian too. That's a disadvantage. Okay, it's far slower, right? So, for the point flipping example, right? We could have just then, the binomial distribution, plug in my data, and my parameter, one step, the equation, right? Or even flip 200,000 points. Well, it could be the right answer, but the flipping is a lot harder to do. So, if you have a better, if you have a closed form solution, you should do that. We do this if you don't have that. Okay. <coughs> There's no checking for model feasibility. So, now we're letting people develop their own model. It might be, very, might be a very bad model. Also, let them run for days and years, finding out they have more information. Okay. And there's many more things to discover. Okay. So that's the basic approach. Um, and there are people who can help with the coding, and people who give us money for stuff. Okay. 
could be Google to include. So, any questions about that? Yeah, let's go back some. Yep. Okay. Oh, it's like, so, okay. So, oh, sorry. One more. Yeah. This is an asymmetry. Yeah. Right? So, um, it means, so for, for low values, a little bit of shift makes the rate of different distance, okay? Whereas for high values, less so. Um, let me give a clue that would be, um, if you think about a perimeter, has, a model has like a traction of some value, right? So here, if I have a very, this would be, um, you know, very, this would be very strong attraction and then very, lesser and lesser attraction, right? So if I have <coughs> a lot of attraction, I might have, real, you know, really good chance of estimating that, so I have a little bit difference of a bigger difference in distance. Whereas here, you know, there's no attraction, so you know I can get sort of any value anyway. This is that much information in my data about how strong that is. That's fine. Yeah. Good question. Other questions or thoughts? So that one thing it was ten lines of code, but you have to have the package that has to be the model. So that was the model. That was the model. That was the model. Yeah, so the package has all like, the infrastructure like, okay, now given this model, let's simulate. Right? But, um, okay. yeah. So we're going to talk about that intrinsic and extrinsic function. Right, so this particular model had no extrinsic stuff. It was all happening internally. It was as far as shift or not. It doesn't care what the other species are doing. And this just generates the entire thing. So, so he has a package. It's called Trevo. T R E V E O. So it's on our forge. It's not on Perrin yet. Yeah, but I mean, this is you know basically like coding. Yeah. Um, so what you know is the functions are in that package. Can... Yeah. Yeah, it's all it's all just three times. You can say, you know. Okay, and this is the next little time step, what happens in evolution. Right, so I'm going to really look at the old, old simulations of, you know, of clades changing over time and stuff. And this is the basic discrete time stuff you can do. Right, so one more time step, what happens. And that's all you see in the code. Now, no, we still have to get this peer review. So it could be that I've made some horrible, horrible error somewhere that appears to say, no, Um, so prior to this, so if you're truly like, close off of a Bayesian, mm -hmm. right, the prior comes from your prior knowledge of the world. So what the data say about it, you can't then go back in time and change your prior to these about the world. Right. Um, that said, that said uh, and so and you might have cases like the case where I found my cross year equal my prior. Mm -hmm. right? It's like, okay, that doesn't seem like I'm not that good. So they can try a different prior and say, oh, yeah, the prior job and everything. What you can also do instead is sort of keep a certain elements of the data. And so I can say, <coughs> um, I can use parsimony. So like for the, that pollinator shift thing, I use poly parsimony and see okay, there's at least there's five changes of pollinator shift on this tree. What kind of probability of change would we need to have an observed five changes? So like if we did that. Uh well if we have like so if the tree is this tree. And you shift here and you shift here, mm -hmm. say, I can say, okay, given this total branch length in the tree, you're only having two changes. Okay, so if you can branch them and add them up. Okay, so I have, you know, 40 million years of time and two changes, so my change rate is by two over 40 million years. 
so I could have my prior set to be centered on that value. That's what we're doing. So sort of we call it the, the polite term for it is empirical priors. The polite term is keeping the data. Yeah, but I mean, getting priors is an issue with Bayesian stuff in general. Like, sometimes as you hope your data can overwhelm your priors, right? Um, so you have lots of data. So if I, if I guess it was this, the true is over here, with enough data, I'll get that as my posterior out. Um, it depends. I mean, you won't get, you shouldn't get exactly, well, you should get, in general, you shouldn't get exactly the same probability out, but how much depends on the part and how much data you have. So you can the posterior is basically prior times likelihood of the normalizing term. Mm -hmm. right? And if the likelihood is very big relative to prior, that's one. Good question. Yeah. And I mean, this would be useful for telling all the two you have your trees and you have to have questions about models because you don't have to them all available. You can still run the solution up into your habits. So, I would take the two bits and shape them. Yeah, so I mean, what's, your, what's your question about shape change? Well, I, let's say I have figured out a, a sh the shapes of different, the difference in the shape between the part of the I can just impose that on a right on a tree from character to this. So, right. And I'm just looking at that shape. Right. Right. I mean, so what this will give you is if you have a question about the parameters, so like how often does shape change? Or can shape not get more different than X? Or the shape of this species is actually of that species. You could um, incorporate that stuff, right? So I want to do, you know, question of, you know, escalation. What does shell thickness correlate of, of one species correlate with overall, you know, nasty biting things of some other species, right? So you could have, as on the time axis, the, part, the you know, the nasty biting incidence rate. And then see if your other thing evolves from the portion to Is there no problem doing this for like kind of like what is Oh you can do it for language. I mean anything with the tree structure. But I mean, isn't it unfair like it doesn't matter? You're assuming a direction of evolution in terms of like no horizontal. Good point. Yeah, so this model is assume a tree, not a network. You could put a network in. So here you could say, if here's the thing, I, and I know that I had a first of these transfer here, yeah. I can say, okay, at this point, you could have, you know, here's the chance of getting this state here or this state here. Would that be extreme? Would that be extreme? Extreme? Like, factor? Or no, that would just, that would be something about the inheritance. So, yeah, I mean, you could have an extrinsic factor. Actually, yeah, what we do with hybridization overall is that an extrinsic factor, where at any time point, there's a temperature change to take your extrinsic one, a value from one of the other neighbors. So that would be a way of people that you have to have a general tree structure. Or you could supposedly model it as a to transfer a certain period of time. So, something we haven't explored. But the way of doing it extrinsically actually works work, work, work really, really well. Thank you. Other questions or thoughts? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the <laughs> 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 you've worked on for what, three years now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even if I was going to get my friends, I mean, I, I was thinking more of like, I believe in a particular way of having a Mm -hmm. backtrack out what's most likely, if what you determine is actually graphical, is most likely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, if you, again, you could, you could make, make it up a project question, you know, ABC thing, or simulating many times. Or, yeah, that's what yeah. I mean. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about you know, species, but you mm -hmm. species. I think the thing that when you're getting evolution, Things go at stake. So I'm wondering if there's some way we can throw in a spatial parameter in here and like what happens. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, so, we, so the way we've done this, so I say it's a general model, but we assume that we have a known tree. And the known tree could have extinct stuff on it. That's okay. Um, but what we don't do is simulate the entire tree with extinction. But you could make a model like that with the ABC model. You'd say, okay, I'm evolving up from the root, and then I only took those trees that have the same number of observed tip tacks as I have now, that allow extinction speciation to happen. Yeah, so you could definitely do that. The problem there is that the permanent space can get big and you allow species to extinction. Sometimes you get zero species out, sometimes you get a large number. So. More rare trees, not more species. That, but also just like the way, like here, we sort of, you only have four species, we'll always have four species, which we have from zero to a million species. So I've done some things with that sort of project, and there are sometimes some things just run away. Thank you all for inviting me.